Welcome back to the Secrets of the Scrolls, uh, an Elder Scrolls Legends podcast. This week I have Boom's Life joining me, and we're going to talk about Boom's Life and what he's been doing with the game, and then, no shocker here, if you have the Monk Expert, we're going to be talking Monk this week. We're also going to talk about sort of the meta as a whole. Do we think it's healthy? Do we like where the meta's at? Are there some changes we would want to see? And finally, we're going to talk about what separates, say, a top 100 legendary player from other players in the game, especially someone, say, around 1,500 legendary. What separates these groups? I have some ideas. I think Boom's Life will as well. So without further ado, I welcome to the show Boom's Life. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me, Tiny. Uh, I'm excited to have you. Uh, you you may be uh, everyone's favorite streamer, as much as that might sadden my own heart, because I consider myself <laughs> to be a decent streamer. But people are always like, you know who's awesome is that Booms Life guy. I'm like, what, what about the Tiny Grabs guy? And they're like, he's all right. <laughs> but that Booms Life guy, he is the man. Yeah, my, my viewers are amazing. Really, really amazing. So, Booms Life, I, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody else. Uh, is this your first card game, or do you come from Legendary from another card game? Uh, I come from one other, uh, another card game. Uh, I come from a card game called Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh! But... How, how deep into Yu-Gi-Oh! did you get? Were you like a high-level tournament player? Were you a local shop kind of player? I, 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 I was a tournament player, but uh, it's, it's, it's been a while ago, like uh, when I was 13, I think, I started playing competitive. I won my first regional when I was 13 nice. in the Netherlands, and I uh, think I won my second one when I was 15, but after that, I kind of quit the game. And because, uh, <laughs> was it you know, because was you discovered teenager. girls' booms life? I just got to ask. <laughs> yeah, I got a girlfriend, so <laughs> she, she made me quit the game. Yeah, well, story of a lot of people's lives right there. So now yeah, you're back true. into card games, and uh, how are you liking Legendary so far? Uh, I, I I love legends. Like they do so much right, so much right. Still a few things wrong in my opinion, but so much is right. So I'm having so much fun. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Um, when did you get into the game? Did you get in like right at the end of the closed beta when it seems like everyone got in, or were you in the closed beta for a long time? No, I was. I got in uh, the last uh, the last call from the closed beta. So three days before the open beta, gotcha. like a lot of people. Okay, cool. And uh, I, I got to ask, when did the fascination with Monk start? Was that the first deck you ever tried in this game? Or did you sort of, you know, go around, try a bunch of decks, and then find Monk? No, w what happened was um, when I just started the game, I looked at what uh, decks were strong, and Archer was dominating at that time. Okay. So uh, I, I made an, my own version of Archer based around TVP's uh, list. Like heavily based on his list, but it made some changes. And I actually did uh, Legend number three with it in like the first week of playing. But I made a post about it because I was kind of proud, but nobody gave, nobody cared because I was basically a net decker. Sure. <laughs> so I looked up what the, what the weakest um, classes were at the time, and a lot of people were si <laughs> saying Monk, and I think it was Crusader. I'm not sure. I think I think everybody was saying Monk and Crusader. Sure. So uh, I looked at the decks and Monk. I saw Thieves then Master of Thieves, and I fell in love with the deck. I thought really cool. I, I I can make this work. I like that. So you're so basically the motivation was you will not ignore me now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that's actually a really good approach if you want to become known like if you want to become a streamer or a video maker and you want to really stand out I, I like that it's you either have to take that approach or you just have to be dominatingly good at the meta decks right yeah i agree I agree or completely. be terrible with random decks and just have fun with it some people love that yeah, some people love that yeah, yeah. that's true I'm, I'm not a big fan of that i'm not gonna watch a stream of somebody playing wabba jack and stuff like that and losing every game that doesn't interest me but I, 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 I think your streams are mostly wabba jack lately aren't they <laughs> hey man, I played like one game with the Wobba Jack and whooped with the Wobba Jack. So. Oh, okay. And I discovered a new way to say it. You gotta say it like this Wobba Wobba Wobba. It sounded good to me, but maybe I'm, I'm on an island there. I don't know. Nah, it uh, sounds good. 
All right, let's let's go into some depth then with the monk archetype because despite you continually having great success with the monk archetype, not just good success, but like top ten legend consistently, people still people uh, me included in that in the in those ranks continue to say things like when you make a tier list, where does monk fit in? Uh, monk's pretty low. Um, so why are people like me so foolish that we just can't grasp how how good Monk is? What is going on there? Uh, that, that that is a rough question. Like um, I think Monk, if you look at it, uh, and how I started to look at it, is the first thing you think is let's make a control Monk, right? Because it's yellow with green. Sure. So a lot of people think let's make a control Monk. At least from the start, a lot of people think a lot of removal should be good yellow late game is great i tried it myself that way i didn't really had success with it and uh so i started to go a little bit more mid-range and i have no idea how i how it wor how it's working so good but i don't know how you guys are not seeing this <laughs> no i'm just kidding but uh it, it's been working like uh, obviously at the moment there are uh, some decks that are a little bit too strong so when you make a tier list Monk is hard to fit in. I'm definitely not one of the guys saying that Monk is the best deck at the moment. But but I do believe that every deck can have success and that not, not everything is tried out yet in the game. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think any tier list that gets made is kind of like, yeah, it's a tier list, but the meta is pretty diverse. There's a lot of stuff that can happen. Um, and a lot of stuff's going to change. I mean, it's one of the reasons why uh, Team Prophecy was making meta snapshots, and we still do, but the meta's yeah. been shifting so wildly, we're like, okay, uh, oh, nope, nope, uh, oh, eh, and it's just completely stalled out the tier list. Thankfully, uh, CVH has stepped up and been like, listen, I don't care if the meta's shifting wildly. Here, at this moment in time, <laughs> here's what it looks like. Tomorrow, maybe I look like an idiot, but I'm willing to undergo that ridicule. Yeah. Uh, so, what would you say are some really key cards in Monk that fit into most Monk decks? Let's say someone's like, man, that Boom's Life is such a genius. I want him to start playing Monk. What are the cards you need to start with? Uh, honestly, um, Javelin is something you need, but that's in every yellow deck at the moment. If you want to play Monk, like if you really want to focus on Monk, I say Craft Anashi. Anashi is my favorite card in this game. She's absolutely amazing. Even with her stealth nerf? Uh, it's a little bit annoying. <laughs> I have to be honest. Why don't you talk about the stealth nerf? What happened to poor Anasi? Oh, poor Anasi. Now, now uh, when she steals a ward, the uh, effects of losing a ward uh, do go off. And before the nerf, they didn't go off. So you have Brent and Conjurer. You have the um, uh, Ilikas. Th those Daggerfall Mages, mm -hmm. those kind of cards, th those effects trigger now, which is a huge nerf to Anashi. Yeah, for sure. Some people some people say, it's, ah, it doesn't happen that much, but now you have one, um, and like Sorcerer is a pretty good counter at the moment, I want to say, against my Monk version at least. Right. Maybe some people have uh, more success with it, but for me it's pretty rough now after the nerf. So I, I was not that happy, I have to be honest. I mean, the one upside of that is, who the hell plays Sorcerer? <laughs> it's like <laughs> one out of every thousand games on the ladder. So at least you're okay there. I have to say, in top ten, there is one guy that runs a lot of Sorcerers. So uh, running into him, it's a little bit annoying. Okay. So that is frustrating, especially if you're playing yeah. mostly in the top ten and you're seeing this one person. And if you're playing in the top ten and you're playing at the same time of day, you could hit him several times, like four out of ten times or something, which would be exactly. very frustrating. Exactly. Okay, I can understand yes. that. Plus, Daggerfall Mage is in nearly every mage deck that's not really aggressive. Yeah. All right, so what but do you Dagger like so much about Anasi? What, what, what makes this such a great card? Uh, honestly, the, the reason why I love her so much is that uh, if you have her on turn five, you... You uh, a lot of times you're afraid of breaking runes because of wire bats. Mm. If you have a Nashi in your hand, you just steal the drain, which is absolutely amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that five, is five with so drain amazing. On turn five is it's basically javelin or you gain five health. Exactly. 
So that that and uh, obviously wire bed is really strong at the moment and basically in every green deck. Yep. So it, it just gives you that more security that you don't have to be afraid of an uh, wire bed or, okay. uh, or or even fight a guild recruit. Is it also because um, she's really flexible and that like if you if you have a deck that's trying to be a bit more aggressive, she handles guards. Uh, if you're trying to be a bit more controlly, maybe you can grab drain and and stuff and 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 guard to make your own guys guard. Is that one of the real uh, benefits of her of fitting into all monk decks? I agree. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, and now she's just great overall. The stat line is already good for a five drop. It's yeah. a five five four five. That's fine. And with an effect like as uh, uh, diversified as this. It, it's, it fits in every monk deck. I'm not going to say you need it in every monk deck, but it fits in every monk deck. Right. And that's what's so great. If you're going to craft a legend, um, you want a card that fits in pretty much all the decks that you're playing of that archetype. Exactly, yes. Okay. I agree. So, speaking of, of legendary cards, what about um, the Descendant of Alkosh? Do you feel like this is a must-craft for monk players, or this is a luxury for monk players? I, um, it's really, really hard to uh, give an ass on that. But my my stance on it is, if you run Thieves Den, uh, it's not necessary. Hmm. Okay. Uh, at, at least if you want to run Master of Thieves, right? I, I'm sure. looking from it from a perspective. For if you want to run Master of Thieves, yeah. If you want to run, run it with Divine Verbers, which uh, is what I'm doing at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, then they are absolutely necessary because you need the few pull for cards uh, for the Master of Thieves. Right. So, but if you run Thieves, then I, I, I think you can cut them. I, I, I Sometimes they just lose you the game as well. Like everybody's saying, it's such a great turn one. But if you play it, if you play it, play it into a uh, Fighter Guild Recruit or a uh, two tree guard, the yellow one, mm -hmm. or a Witch, you're already one card behind from turn sure. one, which is hard to recover from. Yeah, so uh, it, it is a good card, but it definitely has has counters. Let me and say then, that. Um, that doesn't even mention you play it on turn five. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And you you're kind of forced to run three because you want to have it on turn one, right? Because it's so good on turn one, so you want to have it more often on turn one, and then drawn into it later. Sometimes it's fine if you can fit it in somewhere. So if on turn five and you have four and a one drop, it's fine. Right, but. After that, you, this is not something you want to top deck at around turn eight, seven, seven eight, nine. That's something you don't want to see. Um, speaking of Master of Thieves, do you feel like this card is sort of the linchpin of Monk, or do you feel like there's lots of good Monk builds that don't actually use Master of Thieves? I, I think there are enough um, uh, Monk builds that don't run the Master of Thieves. It's just not a Monk list that I want to run. The card is so, so amazing. I love the effect of it. The body is fine. Like a 3-5 with such a big effect for 4 is great. So I love building around it. Like It's a card that I would never cut out of my monk list. But I know there are a few monk lists that, do, uh, that don't run Master of Thieves and are doing okay. Sure. <laughs> why don't, why don't you tell us why Master of Thieves is so amazing? Like what, what makes him so great? Like... Sure, it's obvious if you get like a daring cup purse on, on the prophecy on turn three or something, and then you play a master of thieves turn four, you get to attack twice with the daring cup purse. We all see that. But what are yeah. some of the more advanced elements of masters of master of thieves that makes him so great in your opinion? All right. So for the deck that I'm running at the moment, I run uh, triple descendant of Alkosh. I run um, triple cup purse, and I run double burglars as my pilfer cards. Okay. At the moment, so I only run eight pilfer cards. So my master of these only synergizes synergizes with those cards since I cut out the divine, uh, the thieves dance at the moment. But uh, the the thing with master of thieves and quinroll burglar, that's the most important thing. Like the quinroll burglar and master of thieves combo can win you games, and they it's such a great comeback mechanic. Yeah, it sure. heals you for, for 12 uh, HP if you have one Master of Thieves with a Burglar. So if you play a Burglar on 6 and you have a Master of Thieves in hand, it happens so often that I just heal for 12. 
<laughs> and a lot of times deal damage for 12, which is so insane. And so, you have a 12, 12 body as well after that. I guess my base. question is, how do you ever, ever, ever get the burglar to live? Because he's the javelin target. He's the lightning bolt target. He is any card they have for removal. It's always, oh, God, there's a burglar. I'm, I'm going to kill him. Do you have some cards that you pair with the burglar that are specifically played before him to root out those cards? Or how does this work? Absolutely. I uh, This is a card that might, might surprise a lot of people, but I love running as my five drop, the Palmarat Renegade. Mm, okay. I absolutely love that card. I, I, I get a lot of hate from it from people. People don't understand it. Why would you run it? It's been so good to me, at least. It's funny because when I first started playing this game, I saw this card, uh, the yeah. Palmar Renegade, and I was like, that card's broken. Like, <laughs> it's so good, it's broken. It draws you cards repeatedly. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and then the problem I ran into it that I think everyone runs into is he becomes instant removal. Um, and so yes. since he doesn't have a come into play effect or a leave play effect, he just dies, but that you're right. It's a really good combo with Burglar because if they're both insta removal cards, you can't remove them both. Exactly. That's uh, that. That was my thought process behind it, uh, behind running it, because they have to deal with it. If they don't deal with it, you're gonna draw it, and you can out control. Even I don't want to say take a control mage, but you can definitely out control and uh, and uh, or out value and uh, scout. Like you can get so many cards from that card. Yeah. They still have to remove it. It's such a good card, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree. And it's, its cost point is nice and low. At only five, um, he's coming on the board when he should be able to eat some smaller guys in a lane uh, and, and really do some work. Like I have to imagine when he hits the board, he either gets removed or draws you a card uh, that very next turn every time. Exactly, every time. Yeah. And so do you often save your Burglar until after you're able to bait out removal, or do you often find yourself in spots where you're just like, all right, here's the deal. I've got Master Thieves in hand. I'm just going to throw this burglar down and hope. How do you normally play that? Uh, it's pretty situational, I have okay. to be honest. It, it really depends on the board state. If I want to drop out my burglar, but sometimes you just have to throw it out and pray yeah. they don't have a javelin. Yeah, for sure. But, but it really <laughs> depends on the matchup and stuff like that. That's why um, I like running Divine Fervors, by the way, uh, because your Burglar will be a 5-5 five five if you sure. have it down, Yep. which 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 actually protects us from uh, Lightning Bolts, which is oh, yeah. pretty huge. Yeah, yeah. Now it's just basically Javelin that kills him. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Javelin and stuff like Fighter's Guild Recruit. And then you drop a Nasi, and that doesn't even help. <laughs> and you still have lane switches, like the Doom Smugglers. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Do you run all <laughs> six lane switchers? Uh, no, I never run the one drop, the spell. Right. I, I don't like it. Okay. Uh, I, and I'm, uh, uh, I, I always run Doom Smuggler at the moment. It's just a good card in general. Sure. Yeah, sure. And uh, the two drop uh, with Prophecy, the tree one, the Stalker, mm -hmm. um, I, 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 uh, there are, they are in my list. One day they are in, the other day they are out. I'm trying them out. Every now and then they work, and every now and then they kind of screw me over. <laughs> How do they screw you over? It's still one held, right? So oh, okay, okay, yeah. They die to everything. They die to yeah, witch. exactly. They die to every archer card in their deck. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's understandable. Um, all right. So when you you were talking about thieves den earlier, you've been talking about divine fervor. Do you consider it an either or? Either I'm running fervor, or either I'm running thieves den, or do you sometimes just chuck them both in? Uh, if I chuck them both in, I run two off of each. Each. Okay. Uh, I don't think you can run uh, six uh, support cards in your deck. I think that's a little bit much. Yeah. So then it's going to be two off of each. You can do it, but. Yeah, I mean, Thieves Den isn't that great when you play it. Like, the Fine Verver, a lot of times you still get an uptrade, right? If you have a 3 3 body and your opponent has a 3 3 body, sure. you get a trade in. But Thieves Den doesn't really do that, so I rather draw into Thieves Den later. Yep. Thieves Den seems more like a going face, closer combo card with Master of Thieves. Whereas Divine Fervor feels a little more flexible, right? It could be a go-face card. It can be a trade-up card. Uh, you get instant value out of it. 
Exactly. A lot of times, I if I have a tease then in hand, which I found out is that a lot of times it's just sitting in my hand until I have a master of tease and I combo from hand. Right. It's never that I can play it and I feel like I don't lose too much tempo on the board. It's always not nah, not always like sometimes you're already ahead, but it's kind of rough to put it in. Yeah, I can understand that. I kind of feel the same way. Like I haven't crafted thieves then. And every time I look at it, I'm like, these den looks really cool, but it feels like very much a combo piece. Uh, and I think yeah. I would, I think if I was going to play Monk, I would prefer to play it not quite as combo-y and just, just get the value. And if, if I get a Master of Thieves combo as well, well, that's great. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. What else I want to ask you about, uh, about this? So you said um, you usually don't play it as control. Have you found that you can play it? Like I was thinking, you could play a, a version where you go something like, um, you know, heavy control, and then you're playing towards like some sort of master of thieves, um, thieves den combo in the late game. You're just kind of controlling the board earlier and and looking to combo and go late more. Have you tried that version yet? Uh, that was my first initial thought process behind okay. the combo, like get, getting board control. Just don't break runes. And finish it in one go with the double or triple attacks. Sure. But but I uh, when the savage was still all right before the savage nerf, which is a while back, you could gain board control. Mm. But I have so much trouble gaining board control at the moment that I don't see a way to do it. Gotcha. Okay. And also also uh, the thing that I think that control monk lacks a little bit too much is card draw. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that one. Yeah, because I don't see you run Crusaders in a heavy control deck. Yeah, right, because you're not maybe. wanting to crush face too much. Yeah, so uh, you could maybe, but then, I don't know, it feels awkward in a control deck, in my opinion at least. Yeah. And uh, then you still have Thieves Guild Recruit, which is which are pretty good, I think. Those, those, would, uh, those would work all right, but what else do you have? Like, the Renegades are not consistent draw, so... Yeah. If you would run that even in your control, so yeah, it, it, that's that, that's the problem with the deck, it, at least sense. in my opinion. Yeah. Um, what about Giant Snake? Have you tried this at all? A, a five drop three three body is pretty bad, but shackle all enemy creatures is pretty cool. I, I've used it a little bit more recently, sporadically, and it, it's often been quite good. Uh, uh, I, I usually uh, I have an uh, sometimes I play it a little bit more aggro. Like I have an aggro list and a little bit more mid range aggro list. Still, still a little bit aggro, but more mid rangey. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my really aggro like base monk list, I, I do run the giant snakes, and they are amazing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just stalling out the turn is so cool. Yeah, I, I definitely see how that would be really strong. You stall out the turn. Uh, there's so many aggressive cards that green can have with cliff racers, and and then you you find your Anasi the next turn and take all their guard away and swing their face. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, any other any other monk secrets you want to leave us with? Any any cards that secrets. maybe are going under the radar that you're like, no, don't miss out, don't sleep on that card. Um, let me think. Um, what I think could work, which I haven't been running myself just yet. Is uh, Torful Crook might actually be a card that's going to be interesting soon. Torful Crook, I think. I the four drop, about. one four silver, gain two extra magicka oh, with charge. Oh, that guy. Wait, did you say with charge? I oh, think you... that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh wow, I'll have to find He's a green card, right? Yeah, that that's a card that I want to try out that I still see potential in. If they ever nerf Wirebat, I think that takes a spot. Huh. Okay. That's an interesting thought. I have to find this guy. I can't remember how much he costs even. Is it is he a three it's drop? Four. He's no, a four, four drop. Oh jeez. That's yeah. really expensive for his ability. You do gain two Magicka straight back though. Like yeah. if you go face. I can't even find this guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh maybe I don't have him. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, I I don't own him myself yet. Oh get... okay. Well then that's the problem. He must be an epic or yeah, epic. here he is, the Torval Crook. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Every time I look at that guy, I'm like, uh, a one four. <laughs> I, I, I get it, I, but I do think there's potential with it. 
maybe. I have to. I still have to try it out, but I think that is uh, maybe it might work out. That's and something said, I'm looking. You said if the werebat gets nerfed, is that because this card would replace the werebat, or you think the werebat's absence would open up possibilities for this card? Yeah, I think uh, the werebat. Uh, if 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 they ever nerf werebat, where mm -hmm. now it's just an auto include. Yeah, it will give me a spot core four drop. Okay, and I gotcha. think this will take it. That's what I'm hoping for, at least, because it looks like a fun card to me. Yeah, I guess especially with somebody like Master of Thieves being able to get four Magicka. Exactly. I mean, that... And it's repeatable. It's not like uh, uh, the, the Solas yeah. Marshal. You, you could theoretically do it every turn, and they and then they're like, are you kidding me? I have to Lightning <laughs> Bolt the Torval Crook? Come on now. <laughs> exactly. That's not right. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of funny. I like the idea of forcing your opponent to do things they absolutely have no interest in doing. <laughs> yeah. That's always fun. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, w one more card before we go. Do you use the Territorial Viper much? I've, I've been using him a little bit more now. I, I cycle in and out with this card. Like, he, he's, he's so unimpactful if there's not something you need to kill. But if there is, he can be so amazing. I don't really like the card. Like, I, I get in some decks you would run it, but it's not a bad card. But for my, for me at the moment, uh, 4-drop is the most contestant spot. I don't want to put, like, 15 4-drops in my deck. <laughs> and the support cards are also 4-drops, right? So Oh, right, right. That's but a, uh, I did run I did run Nest of Vipers for a while. Oh, nice. Yeah, the, the more I think about Nest of Vipers, um, somebody played it against me lately. I think it was Onia played it against me on stream like i was whooping his ass and then he's like i've got two divine fervors out boom nessa vipers ball yeah. game and i was like wait what what happened <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i forgot That's that card what... even exists and you just beat me with it yeah it's so much damage from hand if if, if you have the divine fervors down it's a pretty good card i think yeah it, it feels like um a pretty good closer yeah i i don't how many would you run not more than two right I would run one. You one. can't run more than one, I think. I think two would be way too much. But, but still a ten one, drop, right? It's a fifty card deck. Like one yeah, but means still, you won't see it. it. Still though, uh, I don't know. I I think you want to see it in long games, so Okay, I see what you're saying. It's more likely you'll see it in a long game, less likely you'll see it in a short game. That's fair. Exactly. Yeah. You know a card I would really love to see? Is a, is a card that's like a four drop that says bring to the top of your deck like an eight or higher drop. I think that would be a really interesting card. That, um, that would be a fun mechanic. Thing. So that you could you could get away with playing like one ofs of closer cards if you were willing to probably four drops too cheap. It'd probably have to be like a seven drop itself, like a seven drop three three that says bring an eight drop to the top of your deck. That, that, to be honest, that would make Pascal completely broken, though. Yep, it might have to be uh, a nine dropper higher. Yeah, <laughs> because of Tazcad, which is yeah. really unfortunate, right? Like that's how broken that card is. That like all, all design in the future has to take into effect how broken Tazcad is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, are, are you with me that he needs a small nerf? Uh, I actually think you need to remove the last press. Okay. Yep, I would be. F There's so many nerfs I'd be fine with, but but my theory with this game is, um, if you get a come into play effect, that's amazing. If you get a leave play effect, that's amazing. You shouldn't get both. Like yeah, bo both is too much. It's just too much. And he has you know, he has such a big body too. Like I, I agree, just an eight drop six six with charge, and he's really strong. Yeah, I agree. It's still a finisher, so it's still what you use him most for. Like, the 4-4 makes no sense. It's too strong. Why, yeah. why would you do that? Yeah. I mean, if you are gonna, if you desperately want a Last Gasp, I say something like, Last Gasp, do 2 damage, maybe to an enemy creature. Something yeah, that, like that. that. Yeah, something like that. That wouldn't be that too bad. Right. Like, it could be really bad, right? Like, it could just completely wreck them. But it's not as bad as, like, oh... Here's a 4-4. Four, four. Good luck. I'm going to beat you yeah. again next turn. Oh, and by the way, that 4-4, four, four, he has cover also. So good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. think that's the stupid thing that you can play it in the shadow lane, and then you have 4-4 four, four in the cover. I think that's the problem with yep. it. 
Like like in the normal lane, it's not that big of a deal with four four, but in the right. cover lane, it's so annoying to deal yeah. with. Yeah, it's it's like it's almost impossible. You have to have a spell removal along with a big enough spell or enough creatures to kill them. Like it's just such a yeah. huge investment to take care of both of those bodies that it's. I I, I think we agree it's fairly untenable. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of that, we just we just identified a problematic card. Um, although this is a bit problematic, and I think a couple other cards are problematic, what do you think about the state of the metagame as a whole? Do you find it to be a healthy metagame? Do you like the metagame? Do you see a lot of problems with it? Where do you personally stand on, on where the metagame is at? Me personally, I think the metagame is amazing. Like, really amazing for a card game. There's so many viable decks at the moment. Yeah, I'm, maybe some people disagree because uh, there are a few decks that are a little bit stronger than others. But I do think there's so much uh, variety. I can't even say it. <laughs> variety. Yep. Exactly. So that I think the meta game is healthy, and there will always be a strongest deck or a second yeah. strongest deck like that. So I'm fine with it. I, I, I'm I'm loving the meta game. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm 100% in agree with, agreement with you. I feel like this is actually the best metagame of any card game I've ever played. Um, yeah. And that says a lot. And and actually, one of the main reasons I end up quitting most games is not because of the mechanics, right? There's there's all these cool games right now that all have interesting mechanics, and I'm always like, that's a neat mechanic. That's a neat mechanic. And then I realize, oh, they can't balance their card pool. Because Why? It's a really, really hard thing to do. It is not easy to balance a card pool well. And uh, Elder Scrolls has done such an awesome job balancing it. I just I can't believe how, how good they've done it. I really agree with that. I, I can't believe how they did it. I, I, I would not be able to balance a card game like this. Absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy to get two decks that sort of compete for the top spot, maybe a third one, but... Like, there's just all these decks, like like Monk. You take Monk to great success. You know, we see people taking Crusader to great success and Battle Mage to great success. And all these decks where I'm like, there isn't a viable deck there. And then I'll run into someone playing some combo, and I'm like, wait, what? I'm not sure that deck was viable, <laughs> but it sure beat the hell out of my Tier 1 ladder deck, so apparently it is yeah. viable. Yeah, I, I think uh, I agree with that. It's so amazing. So many different kind of decks. Yeah. People experimenting with it, and it's working. That's that's the amazing thing. That's working. Yeah, I, I've been I've been real impressed. I, I I wasn't in the early stages of the closed beta, so I don't know if the metagame has always been this diverse, or if that's been um, a, a, a willingness of Bethesda and Direwolf to really pay attention to the community. Either way, it speaks well of them, right? Either they're just amazing yeah. at balancing, or they're really good at reacting to the community because it's very dangerous to react to the community, right? Because every day you're going to have someone be like, this card's broken, that card's broken, this deck <laughs> is broken. So you have to be able to filter the noise and find the actual authentic good feedback within the noise, which is very difficult. Yes, I completely agree. Uh, I completely agree. I think, I think while we're on this, I think they listened a little bit too much to the uh, Savage. Yeah, I think everyone agrees with that. <laughs> yeah, they kind of killed the card because everybody was uh, saying it was broken. It, it was broken, but yeah, the nerve was a bit, a little bit harsh. I think what happened is they realized it was broken, and they didn't have a good fix for it. Right? They they probably had three fixes they thought might be okay, but you don't really want to 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 take a card, nerf it, and have to nerf it several more times. Where now what That's they true. can do is they can just revisit the card and be like, all right, we looked at the card for a couple months. This is the new Murkwater Savage. The This this one we have now, this is just, I, I view this as just a holding piece until we get the real new Murkwater Savage. I might be dead wrong, uh, but I just can't <laughs> imagine that this is the final version that they, they took a card that was one of the best in the game and made it one of the worst in the game. Like I just have a hard time yeah. believing that was their, their final goal. I hope they'll change it again a little bit better. Like, yeah. it's a little bit too weak at the moment. Yeah. yeah. There's so many ways you could do it, too. Like, you could easily just make him, like, two costs, two, one, that says he goes up plus one, plus zero. Right? So he can still grow and do tons of damage. Yeah, um, that's a little bit weak. Uh, one, So he will be one HP the whole game? Uh, how about two HP the whole game? 
that, that, that way that he stays out of range of some of the ridiculous uh, archer cards that do one damage. Leave him at I two even HP. Think, I think even the if if you would make it make it a two one that just gets plus one plus one, mm. I still think that's fine because you have an easier way trading into it than you used to have. Yeah. I, I, I really thought... like the idea of him not growing on health, so that he get basically yeah. what happens with him is he can sort of dominate those first two turns and plunk a bunch of health off of you to trigger Soul Rest Marshall, but he doesn't have the sustainability that a two drop shouldn't have, where they they you know eat a two drop, then they turn around and trade with a three drop, and you're like that you just got five uh, value for two. I, I I don't like that aspect. Okay, I, I can see where it comes from with that one. I Yeah, I agree with that. It shouldn't happen that way. But I, I think that would be a really good change. You just He's a 2-2, two, two, starts out, and he only gets plus 1, plus 0. He's a 2-drop. He's still very strong. He's going to do a lot of early damage. He helps propel you into Soul Rest Marshall. But you can trade with him. Like it's You have to trade yeah. your 2-drop for him and take a bunch of the face, but you can trade him. Yeah, I agree. Um, any secret decks you're actually working on? I guess I shouldn't even say secret, but is, are you deviating at all from Monk and sort of like trying out something else like, say, Warrior and trying to crack that? Or are you just trying to become the greatest Monk player that ever lived in any game? <laughs> no, I, I, have, I have a second secret account, so I'm oh, trying to... Oh, you... Whoa! You want to <laughs> unveil that right now? What's, what's your secret <laughs> account name? Nah, I'm not saying my secret. Uh, no, no, no. I actually played you in Arena. You played me in Arena with it? Yeah, mm. I played you in Arena with it. Interesting. Okay, I want to ask you this. You, you can say no. Give me the first letter of the account. Uh, because it's really, really easy to figure out. It's really easy. I will say you this, uh, uh, I, just to see if you remember. I won because I shackled you with the weapon. It's a few days ago. Um, I don't remember any arena games I ever play because I do not okay. care about them. Nah, I'm the same way. I just I would remember that, like check. if I got an awesome win against somebody in a cool <laughs> way, I might remember that. But any losses, I'm just like, I don't care. It was arena. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's I agree with that. Instantly gone from the memory banks. I just don't have enough uh, data slots. I only have like 30k RAM, so I, in my brain. And uh, I've got like 20 gigabytes of information I have to try to store in that spot. So it doesn't work. Uh, yeah. But 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 to come back at the question, I am working on a warrior list. I think warrior is still the class with the most potential, which a lot of people haven't figured out yet. Yeah. I, it feels like warrior is the one deck where I just haven't seen a viable list. And I agree. that I There's so many awesome cards in red and, and purple that... How is it possible that there's not a great warrior list yet? Yeah, I, I have seen uh, Warrior in top ten by uh, Dreamor. Mm, okay. uh, I saw his list and uh, it looks okay, but he himself said it's not that consistent. So I'm looking to make my version. Gotcha. I'm not sure how long it will take because uh, Warrior is still quite expensive. If you go, <laughs> yeah, th the way I'm going, so it might take a while. Are you but going that's the orc direction like. then? I mean, you must be going the orc direction, right? No, not the not, no, not the orc oh, direction. Okay, Come okay. on. Good. Yeah, I, my my warrior build isn't the orc direction either. But the way you said that, I thought it was because you have to get the. You know, the I, I'm looking. I'm looking into a ramp warrior with ramp. the new card. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So I'm waiting for the new card, and then I'll see how it works. Wow, that's really interesting. Ramp warrior with a new card. Um, speaking of that, I guess let's let's talk about Hisgrove then. Everyone else has talked about it, so I wasn't really gonna spend any time on it. Um, yeah. but we'll talk about it briefly. What do you, what do you think about Hisgrove? I think it's a good card in everything but Scout. <laughs> That's hilarious that you'd say that. <laughs> I, I think it opens more uh, ramp, like Warrior, for example. But yeah. I don't think it's that great in Scout. It's it's a might be a decent card against. The control match, uh, matchup. Yep, that's what I'm thinking. But, yeah, I, I don't see it like a tree off ever in uh, Scout, to be honest. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, I've said widely that it's either going to be great if Control Mage becomes an overwhelmingly large part of the meta, or it's going to be mostly useless because yeah. you just can't really afford to play for on turn three nothing when you have things like young mammoth that you could be playing um 
and someone said to me that it's a win condition. But in this game, getting two eight eights, it's great, and maybe you win. But it's not a win condition. They don't they don't have a come into play or leave play effect. They may just both die. They they basically do nothing because uh, when they spawn, I, I, at first I thought uh, I think a few other people also thought this that when they come into play, you can straight up attack with them. Oh jeez, they would be broken then. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought first, and I thought, wow, this card is good. And you say broken, but you still need. 15 Magicka. How many card games go? How many games go that long? Sure, but still, if if you could have a card that said get to 15 Magicka, do 16 damage to your opponent's yeah, okay. face. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's a little bit broken. That would be kind of broken. <laughs> yeah, okay. But at first, I thought that was the fact, and then I realized, oh wait, they uh, summoned that turn, so you have to wait a turn, and it's not that good. Yeah, I would love to see um, also a card similar to this that does heal. I think that would be kind of fun, like a three drop um, that maybe procs on like turn ten, t- maybe ten Magicka, and does heal, and that could go in like a control mage deck or something. That might be a, another fun card that fits the similar spot of like, can you take a turn to give up a turn entirely for that late game payoff? Like, I love the design of the card, uh, but yeah. I'm just not sure how relevant it's going to be. I think that's really interesting what you said that. What it what it really does is opens up ramp in non scout decks that don't want to play terrible cards like Tree Minder, exactly. or or maybe wants to play Tree Minder and the Hiss Grove to have more guaranteed ramp. Yeah, yeah, that that is interesting, especially since Red has a glut of cards at like five and above that are really strong. Can I just say the uh, dual legendary the court walk? Or I, I really don't know the name. The dual, the purple, red legendary. Gordon that would Wong. be so. Yeah, that would be so amazing in a ramp deck. Let me see this. I Let's think. See. Oh wow, yeah. I never thought about that because I don't have this guy, so I've never even looked at him. <laughs> but yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> Can you imagine turn five uh, Iron Etronok or no, something no. like that? Turn four because you've got the elixir. Exactly. <laughs> even better. <laughs> wow, that would be crazy. Turn four, uh, Iron Atronach. Turn five, what will be more reasonable? We'll say like the Vigilant Giant. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that, that's uh, not bad. It's not bad at all. Yeah, okay. Uh, and what you could do, Boom's Life, you get real crazy. And uh, you could play only spells uh, before like five drops, and so that he's only pulling like fives and six drops. That's that's not a bad idea. I, you you would need more spells than we have at the moment. I oh think, yeah, but that oh, would yeah. be cool. That would be a really fun deck, though. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe there's a couple supports you could play. I don't know. I don't I don't think so. I think this is completely unviable when I'm talking. <laughs> but well, that would be yeah. fun. That would be fun. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I got one more topic I want to talk to you about before we head out, and that is: Do you have any thoughts on what separates the truly top people like yourself from, you know, say the person that reaches legendary, they're like 2,500 legendary. What do you feel like are a a, a tip or two that can really help somebody understand what's the difference uh, between this caliber of player? Uh, I can go first if you'd like, so you have a chance to think. Yeah, go for (laughs) it. It's better if you go first. I have to think a little bit about this. Okay, no problem. Um, one thing I think that really separates these two groups is, um, the depth of their understanding of prophecies. And I just released a video today about this where you don't have to know every prophecy in the game. Most are irrelevant. What you do need to know is you have to be hyper aware of the exact prophecies your opponent is likely to run and the best ways to play around them. Um, you know, so for instance, let's say you're playing against... Uh, a deck that has blue in it, you have three health, but you have a uh, a kinsman on board, and you can swing for lethal. Well, you can go ahead and overwrite your kinsman to go up to six, so that when you swing for lethal and have to go through that one last rune, if they have a lightning bolt, it won't kill you. Like This is a trick I've done many times, uh, and any times people have seen me do it, they're always like, oh, that's so cool, I didn't think about that. And it's like, that's something that you need to always be thinking about like what are the prophecies that are coming how do i best play around them i i agree with that i I think that's a good tip um i have another one 
I think um, that if you want to be a top 100 guy or even higher, I think you really, really need to know your matchups and when to trade and when not to trade and when to go face and when not to go face. So learn how much damage you have in your deck, which minions you have on deck, and just try to, try to play her out. But I do agree with the prophecies. It's something you have to play around. I had to get used to that myself in the beginning. But it, it, it's not that hard. I mean, just sit down, look at what um, prophecies there are in the game. There used to be a an, uh, an, uh, graphic for it when I started. Mm. Somebody made that. So that helped a lot. And just really think about it. Yeah. But I think the most important thing is when to go face and when to trade. If you learn that with your deck, whichever deck you're playing, yep. I think that will help a lot. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, it's it's twofold, right? It's both, are you the beatdown deck or are you the control deck? And then it's also, when do you need to shift gears? Like, let's say yes. you are the control deck. You're, you're, there has to be a point where you have to then shift into, I need to be the one killing you mode. When is that in this particular matchup? Um, those kind of questions. I think that's really important. Yes, I agree with that. Um, another one for me would be know the meta. And what I mean by that is not know every deck that people are playing, but at the spot you are at, have an understanding of what people are playing at that spot. So like what you were saying is, in the top 10, there is a Sorcerer build. You know that. And so as you are thinking about your game plans, you're thinking about what deck to bring, you're thinking about how to play your deck, you know going in, there's a dude that's playing Sorcerer, I'm seeing that a lot. Uh, maybe the other decks I'm seeing are... Uh, you know, a Ramp Scout and Control Mage. Those are the three main decks I'm seeing. But maybe that's just Boom's Life top 10 spot. Maybe where I'm at, say, around 80, I'm actually not seeing any Control Mage, right? So you really have to have not just an understanding of what people say the meta is, but what does the meta look like where you are? And I think that's a really important aspect of, of tweaking your deck and tailoring your deck and tailoring your own play to be able to move up then farther. I really agree with that. I, in my chat, I got a lot of questions always about how to beat Dogons. Mm, but that's yep. a deck that I just don't see on the ladder where <laughs> exactly. I'm at. So it's so hard to give, an, uh, to give advice on that. But that are things you just have to learn and uh, play it a lot. And I, the, the tip that I have is always uh, what helped for me to get high uh, is always predict what they can play, what's the worst case scenario and what's the best case scenario. Sure. So always uh, what are their four drops, when they hit four drop, five drop. If you if you expect it, it's not that bad. You can prepare for it right. and stuff like that. I think that's the most important thing, knowing the cards that other people play, even though some, some matchups you see a card that you just don't expect and that happens. <laughs> yeah. It especially I, happens for any listeners if you're playing in what I call... Uh, the the garbage dump like around like two thousand to one thousand legend, boy, it's actually hard to play there because you're like, all right, it's a ramp scout deck, okay, all right, wait, what, huh, what the hell are all these cards? Why is this guy <laughs> playing this in ramp scout? What is a stalwart ally doing in ramp scout? I don't understand. And then it becomes much harder to predict. So it's funny because when you're playing higher up. It's easier to predict. The car the decks are more refined and the players are better, but it's easier to predict the cards. Whereas when you're in the two thousand range, the players are worse, the decks are less refined, but it's actually harder to predict the cards, which is kind of funny. Yes. Yeah, that's completely true. Alright. Uh I had one more idea. Uh I am now failing to remember what said idea <laughs> was. So if you have another one, that's fine. If not, we will uh wrap up this particular segment. Uh, I don't really have an idea. Okay. I think we uh, talked about quite a lot. The meta, yeah. most important thing, I think. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to improve, these are these are some good tips for you. Also, just general things like know the card pool pretty well, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. know your deck really well. And this is one of the big differences between playing, like making a deck yourself and net decking it. So... If Boom's Life takes his Monk deck and plays it, he's going to do far better than I will if I'm playing his Monk deck. I don't even know what the hell's in the deck, right? I'm like, <laughs> how many Burglars did this deck even have? I don't remember. I threw it together in two seconds. 
I've already played two. Am I playing to another Burglar out or not? I don't even know if I have it in the deck. You really need to know the ins and outs of your deck very intimately to be able to, to, be able to do really well with it. Yes, I completely agree on that. That's the best tip I can give. Know your deck really, really well. Yeah. And so what I'm not saying is don't net deck. You you should net deck. That's fine. It's and, and then maybe tweak from there. But don't just throw a deck together, throw it on the ladder, and then whine when it doesn't do well. Like, you really need to be studying this deck before you bring on the ladder. Um, what are the strong cards? What are the cards you want? What are the cards you want a mulligan for? What do you want a mulligan for in a particular matchup? When are you shifting into attacking with this deck against a particular matchup? You know, all these things that Boom's Life already said, uh, they're just so critical to know about your, know, your own deck. Know yourself, know your deck, and then then you'll be ready to, to battle. Yes. I, I sound like a wizened uh, old war general, which I a was. Bit. Like, I was a war general in, uh, in the Korean War. So I'm very, very ancient. Really? No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I can't believe I actually believe that. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, well Boom's Life, uh, where can people find you on, on the Internet? Uh, usually on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv, uh, booms, boomslife.tv, and uh, on Twitter, same thing, boomslife.tv. All right. Do you um, uh, uh, do YouTube at all? Uh, not yet. It's something I'm looking into, but I'm not sure yet if I have the time for it. Okay. Maybe later. I mean, the nice thing is you can always just um, crop out videos from your uh, from your Twitch, you know, stream. Yeah, that's true. It. I do that sometimes. It's hard, though, because you're like, you have to be thinking about as you're doing it because you have to write down the time when it happened and all the stuff, and then I can never find them. Uh, Don't you use uh, copyright music, though, in your stream? See, Because I I do. I don't stream any music, and one of the main reasons is for that very reason, that it it makes it impossible to be able to use them on YouTube. I don't know. I I don't like grinding without any music on. I I have to, I don't know. You know what the music is, Boom's Life? It's my voice. Hmm. The beauty of my voice is like music. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> oh, I think it's more like elevator music, though, than actual good music. But that's okay. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitch TV, uh, Tiny Grimes. I have a YouTube channel. I'll put it in the show notes because it's some crazy uh, channel name. You can find me on Twitter at Tiny Grimes Games. Um, I generally stream Monday through Friday about... 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, do you have a scheduled time that you're going Boom's Life, or do you go when you're available? Uh, I go when I'm available at the moment. Okay, sounds good. So fine, just follow Boom's Life channel, and uh, then you'll, you'll get a notification when he goes live, and then rush over to his stream and, and watch all of the monk greatness. Exactly. Well, Boom's Life, thanks so much for coming by. It was great having um, the monk expert <laughs> stop by. That, that's been great. So thanks so, thanks much, so much for having me. All right. Well, we'll have Boom's Life on again, I'm sure, sometime. And thank you for joining us for another episode of The Secrets of the Scroll.